Hi, my name is Skylar Church. I am a California real estate broker as well as a member of the education department at accredited real estate schools. We offer those course requirements to be eligible to take the state exam to obtain your California real estate license, but also a bunch of different options to help you prepare for that state test. And one thing you always need to know, make sure you're proficient in, is the vocabulary. So these are going to be the terms 26 to 50. We already did the first 25. And you want to make sure you are proficient in vocab. It's a, basically a reading comprehension exam. So let's get to it and start with the first one. So the first term we have is chattel. Chattel. Well, you should be thinking of property. Now, should you be thinking of personal or real property? Well, when you see chattel, you, be, you should be thinking of personal property. So it's per personal property that exists on a freehold estate. So automatically, when you think of, when you see chattel, think of personal property, okay? Personal property. Government patents. Government patents. Okay, so remember there are ways to transfer property. And one of them is if a, the sovereign is giving it to a member of the public, they do so with a government patent. This is used to transfer title. So when the government deeds a property from the sovereign, which is just another name for the government, to an individual, it is accomplished by a government patent. So this is how they deed the property over when the sovereign is giving it to an individual. Government patent. See, we're going pretty fast here. Depreciation, okay. So depreciation, you should be thinking of it from two perspectives. One from an appraisal standpoint, and then another one from a paperwork loss that the IRS lets you take on your taxes. So depreciation for tax purposes is a paperwork loss that the IRS allows a property owner to take on their income tax return. So depreciation, and remember, there's the schedule you get if it is a... Um, Remember, depreciation is allowed only for an income-producing property, and it is um, for residential and commercial. They have different depreciation schedules. So you should know, remember, 27 and a half years for straight-line depreciation if it is a residential property. Um, of course, you have to know the years, too. But then for commercial, it is 39 years. So that's what you should, be, you should know and keep, keep on hand. And then depreciation for appraisal purposes. Remember, depreciation is just a loss of value for any reason or from any cause. So we have those three types of depreciations we classify from an appraisal standpoint. We have physical deterioration, functional obsolescence, and economic obsolescence. So remember, that's how we categorize depreciation from an appraisal standpoint. And it's loss of value for any reason or from any cause. Backfill. Okay, so backfill. And remember, this is different than infill. Okay, infill is completely a different term than what backfill is. Backfill deals with soil and what you use to put around like a building or maybe the footings, for instance, when you have excavated soil. Um, so it's soil that is filled in around a foundation, retaining wall, or other excavations. So you're putting soil back. You're filling it in <laughs> where it was taken out, and you need to put it in when you are doing construction. So, for instance, near the footings of a foundation, retaining wall, or some other type of excavation, backfill. And remember, infill is very different than backfill. Infill is just that unused area that small commercial developers plan to develop. Backfill is where you're filling back the soil. <laughs> so remember that. Unruh, unruh, okay. So unruh. What should you be thinking of? Well, you should be thinking of fair housing in California, a state-specific Fair Housing Act that we have that's called UNRU Civil Rights Act. And this is the California state law that prohibits discrimination in business establishments. So UNRU deals with um, prohibiting discrimination in California when it happens in business establishments. So when I think of UNRU, I automatically think of business. That's how you can kind of keep it in mind because remember, we also have like the Holden Act, for instance, that deals with 
prohibiting discrimination, but in lending. So you kind of have to keep these key terms. When you think of UNRU, you should be thinking of the fair housing that we have on a California state level that deals with prohibiting discrimination in business establishments. And that is UNRU. Okay, look, we've already done five of the terms. Let's move on to the next one. FERPTA. FERPTA. Well, you should be thinking of some type of, um, when you're dealing with somebody that is selling a property and they are foreign or a foreigner, you have to um, withhold 15%. And so let's kind of like go through this a little bit, the proper definition of it. So FERPTA is Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act. That's the technical term of it. And we just call it FERPTA. And this is on a federal level. So foreign individuals who sell real estate they own in the U.S. are required to withhold 15% of the gross sales price to pay capital gains taxes on the sale of the property. A seller's affidavit is used to ensure the seller pays the capital gains taxes that are due. So you as a buyer, and escrow usually assists you with this, need to confirm that the seller, if they are of a foreign individual, that they um, that they are, you know, withholding this 15% of the gross sales price to then go towards a capital gains tax on the sale of the property. Now, if you, if they're not a foreign individual, then we use a seller's affidavit. So the seller is affirming the fact that they are not a foreign individual. Um, and so then that would be kept on file as well for your records and escrow and usually your agents. And if you are taking the state exam, you're wanting to be an agent, <laughs> um, we'll assist with going through this paperwork as well, because this is on a federal level called FERPTA. And you should be thinking of withholding 15% when a foreign individual sells real estate. That's all you really need to have a key thing in your mind. Withholding 15% of if sold by a foreign individual. And that's on the federal level. We do have the state one, CalFERPTA, which is three and a third percent for, um, from if, for California if they're not a California resident, the seller anyways. So blanket trustee, a blanket trustee or a blanket encumbrance. You should be thinking of a trustee that blankets multiple parcels or multiple properties. So a loan that is placed on several parcels of real property. And so you have one basically trustee, it's a blanket one for all of these parcels. And what happens though when you just want to take one away or take one of the parcels off of it? Well, we use a release clause or a partial release clause and it's used to remove a parcel from under the blanket trust deed or blanket encumbrance. So this is used a lot, especially with subdividers, subdivision um, developers. They want, um, they'll have one giant trust deed on multiple parcels, even though there's gonna be different APN numbers on all of them, they can do one giant trust deed over it. And then when they sell one lot or they develop one lot, for instance, they're able to then use a release clause or partial release clause to remove that one specific parcel from the blanket trust deed. Liquidity, liquidity. Well, you should be thinking of real estate is not a liquid asset, it's illiquid. And what does liquidity mean? This is just how fast you can convert an item into cash. So how fast can you get cash in hand from that item? Um, so real estate, it takes time to sell it and convert it and get it cash out of it to get that money in the pocket. It takes time. So it's something that you can't just decide on a whim, sell it that day, get your money for it. Whereas um, stocks, for instance, those are considered a relatively liquid asset because you can convert it into cash much quicker than, for instance, real estate. So liquidity. Trustee, trustee. So you should be thinking, well, there's two things that might come to mind. Well, if you're dealing with an actual trust, the trustee of that trust, but for real estate, more specifically for California, the state exam, you should be thinking of trust deeds. And who is the trustee? Who, what party are they in regards to a trust deed? So a deed of trust. Well, the trustee is that independent third party that holds the basic legal title to the property. Remember, the trustee has the power of foreclosure of being able to sell the property 
foreclose the property basically and recoup the money for the lender, for the beneficiary. So the trustee is just this third party that holds the basic legal title to the property. So they're able to foreclose if the borrower defaults on the loan. Devise. Devise. Well, you should be automatically thinking of will. To will a property. So devise. So to leave real property by will. That's what devise means. So as you can tell, when we're talking about freehold estates, especially fee simple estates, they are in a state of inheritance. They have the ability to devise property. And that just means to leave property by will. You can leave it to your heirs. Look at that, another five down. Let's move on to the next one. Stock cooperative, stock cooperative or a stock co-op. What are we talking about here? Well, you should be thinking of a company that owns property and they use stocks to actually hold ownership in the property. So it's a building that is owned by a corporation and each unit is transferred by transferring stock instead of using a grant deed. So you know how we usually use grant deeds. Well, instead, it's just stock in the building. So the amount of stock that you have is what for the unit that you would get. So that's a stock co-op, a stock cooperative. Um, and if you are wanting to transfer that unit, you would transfer it by using the stock instead of a grant deed or whatever type of deed you might use. But in California, grant deed is the most popular. CCNRs. Then we have CCNRs. CCNRs are just covenants, conditions, and restrictions. Now, when you're talking about covenants, conditions, and restrictions, this, this is an encumbrance based on use, so it limits title. And when you breach a covenant, it's just a minor breach of a promise, and it's remedied by monetary damages, so usually just a fine. Whereas if you breach a condition, it's a major breach, very serious, and is remedied by loss of title to the property. So if you are going to, for instance, buy a property that was CCNRs, and maybe they have a very strict HOA, very strict CCNRs, and they say you can only have the exterior pink color of your home be the set approved colors. Let's say you've always dreamed of having a purple house. You paint your house purple, you breach the condition, it could then, you could lose your title to the property because you breached the condition. It's very, very serious. And when you breach a condition, it is extremely, um, it's very, very serious. And because of that, it requires the condition needs to be in the deed. So that's important to know. Whereas a restriction is just a private deed restriction and restricts the use of the property. An injunction is used to enforce these private deed restrictions. It's just a court action to stop an activity or forced compliance. So this is what you need to know about CCNRs, covenants, conditions, and restrictions. Covenants, Minor breach, usually just a fine condition. You could lose title. It's a major breach. Restriction, this is usually just like a private deed restriction, and they'll usually use an injunction to force, force compliance. Um, so make sure you know that. To fixture, this is one you should know of. Fixture. This is personal property, but because of the way it's attached or affixed to the land, it is considered personal. Uh, it's considered real property. So personal property that it becomes real property. So the technical term when a personal property is incorporated into the land and becomes real property. So you would think it's personal property. Maybe it's a microwave. Um, but because let's say it's built into the cabinetry, built into the wall, it's then considered real property and it is a fixture. And we use the test for Maria. Remember Maria? Method of attachments. Adaptability, relationship, intent, and then agreement. So those are the five tests that we use for if it's a fixture, Maria. So then we have R value, and this is dealing with resistance to heat flow um, in regards to insulation. So the greater the R value, the greater the resistance to heat flow. So for instance, with attic insulation, R60 would be better than R30. And it's just more of an efficient, effective insulation. It's just a better insulation, the greater the number because it's the greater the resistance to the heat flow. Covenant of quiet enjoyment. 
Covenant of quiet enjoyment. So this is a covenant. Now, what is this? This deals with if you are a landlord and you are renting out a property, you owe your lessee the covenant of quiet enjoyment where they can enjoy the property without your interference, without prop, without following set rules and specific um, rules. So a property owner must not interfere with the tenant's quiet enjoyment of a property. So let's say the tenant decides to not pay rent. You have to go as the landlord through the proper channels of doing the eviction proceedings. You can't just go in and turn off the electricity, turn off the water. That is breaching the covenant of quiet enjoyment that the tenant has, even if they're breaching the terms of the lease. You cannot turn off the water, turn off the electricity. Um, you can't just show up on the property and want to and demand entrance unless it's an emergency, of course. There's like a water leak, a gas leak, something like that. You have to give proper notice. So it's a covenant of quiet enjoyment that you can't um, um, impede the enjoyment of the tenant. This isn't like talking about the neighbors where your tenants have the ability to enjoy their property based off of not having nuisance from their neighbors. That's totally different. When we're talking about the covenant of quiet enjoyment, it deals with the landlord and the tenant and that relationship. Discounting, discounting. Okay, so when we're talking about discounting, we're actually talking about not discount points. That's different. Discounting is when you have the face value of a note and you sell it for less than that face value because you want money now as a lender. You want the money now in your pocket. So it's selling a promissory note for less than the face value of the note. So let's say you made a loan um, and you have this promissory note, this IOU, that you're going to get paid, let's say it back $100,000 plus interest, everything like that. Well, let's say you want money now instead of waiting maybe the 30 years for it to recoup all that money. Well, it's called discounting if you're going to sell it to someone else and they're going to take over for that promissory note and take the payments that the borrower has, but they're going to pay you cash less than what the actual face value of the note is. So maybe they might pay you $80,000 for it. But this way, the lender gets the money in their pocket now rather than waiting the 30 years to get all their money plus interest and whatever terms of the um, agreement uh, were. Hypothecation. This is just a fancy term. Hypothecation. Hmm. What do you think of when you see hypothecation? Well, you should be thinking of placing a property as collateral for a real estate loan. So hypothecation, you should be thinking of collateral. So you're placing the property as collateral for the loan. So remember, when you have the, um, a, you're using a deed of trust, for instance, it's with an IOU, which is the promissory note. The promissory note specifies what is your, the borrower is going to be paying back, but it means nothing if the lender doesn't have collateral. So they usually will place the property that they're actually making the loan for as collateral for the loan, and that is called hypothecation, hypothecation. After acquired title, after acquired title. Well, this is dealing with if the lender has to foreclose, so the trustee forecloses on the property, and let's say maybe a barn was built on the property, well, the trustee is able to also foreclose on the parcel of property and that will also include the barn, even though the barn wasn't something originally on the property, for instance. Um, so it's just buildings that are built on a property that is already encumbered by a loan will be acquired by the lender if the property is foreclosed in the future. It's a technical term. So like a barn, for instance, maybe a garage, something that was built on the property but that property is already encumbered by a loan, that new addition will be acquired by the lender if the property is from foreclosed in the future. Eviction, eviction, okay. Well, when we're talking about eviction, you should be thinking of the three steps. You need to know this in California. What are the steps for an eviction? Well, if the tenant decides to stop paying rent, or breaches the terms for the lease, for instance, and you can't come to an amicable, amicable, <laughs> amicable <laughs> resolution, then you'll have to go through the eviction proceedings, and that gets the court involved. Usually, you won't get your money, um, and so it takes time because there are three steps to this. What are the steps? 
Well, the first thing is the three-day notice to pay rent or quits. So you have that three-day notice to pay rent or quits. If the tenant does not pay rent within those three days and usually pay with the late fee or quit the premise, then you'll then have to file an unlawful detainer action. And at that point, then you'll get a court order that is the writ of possession where the sheriff will actually remove the tenant from the property. So you as the landlord will, will receive that, that possessory interest that you gave, that one of those that little rights, the stick of rights that you have in your bundle of rights of the possession, you'll receive it back. So that is what the eviction is for. So it's used to remove a non-paying tenant from the premise or, for instance, if it was some other breach of terms. And usually the biggest breach of terms is if they don't pay. <laughs> and then it becomes an estate at sufferance. Option. Now, what's an option? An option is just an offer that remains open. So a contract to keep an offer open. So you can have this as a type of listing agreement. So there's an option listing. Um, there's options you can use for, you know, a, for instance, if you're a tenant, but you have the option to purchase it. So you might be paying more in rent but because you're having the option to purchase it at an already predetermined price at a certain time. It's an offer that remains open. And the optionor gives the option to the optionee. So you need to keep that in mind. So the optionor is the one that gives the option. So the one that has to basically give the option and the option remains open, and the offer's open. And the optionee is the one that actually can exercise the option. So they're the ones that actually hold the option. Okay, last set of terms, avulsion. Avulsion. Well, you should be thinking of this falls under a session because a session is something that is where you um, – a gradual buildup of um, – or man-made of, um, of land. So you get more land based on um, gradual buildup of soil, so of alluvium, or if it's man-made through annexation, so accretion or annexation. Well, the opposite of this, it falls under it is avulsion. This is the rapid tearing away of the land, of the soil. So the rapid tearing away of land by water action. That is avulsion. So it's the opposite of a session. Beneficiary. Well, I already talked about beneficiary just slightly a little bit ago in this particular video. Beneficiary, we're talking about when a trust deed is used and the lender is going to give money to the trustor, the borrower. Well, another name for that lender is beneficiary. So beneficiary and lender, when it comes to a trust deed, mean the same thing. And knowing this, what is a beneficiary statement? Well, beneficiary statement is when, let's say, you are selling a parcel of property and you have a loan on the property. It's encumbered by a trust deed. Well, you will be asking your lender to say, hey, how much is actually owed at this point in time on my loan? Well, the beneficiary, the lender, will provide a beneficiary statement providing that number. So when a borrower pays off an existing loan, the lender sends a beneficiary statement to escrow, alerting the escrow agent to the amount of funds necessary to pay off the existing property loan. So to then get rid of this encumbrance and make the property, well, unless there's other liens, for instance, on the property, free and clear to sell it to a different buyer. Beneficiary statements. Sometimes deductive, deductive reasoning assists once you know certain terms. LTV, LTV, loan to value ratio, loan to value ratio. This is the loan amount and you divided it by the sales price or the appraised value, whichever is lower. So usually a lot of times, like conventional loans will be 80% um, LTV. Well, that's just saying it'll be 80% um, of the sales price or appraised value, whichever one's lower, will be a loan. And usually you don't need to have PMI at that point. Um, so that's very standard conventional. Um, so um, they're also going to be looking at other, other aspects of it. But it's just the loan amount. So let's say it's $100,000 purchase price. The sale price is $100,000, also appraised for $100,000. Well, and that loan is going to be 80% of it. Um, they want 80% LTV. So then the loan would be $80,000. 80,000 divided by 100,000 is 80. Um, so that's the LTV. 
Last one, REO, real estate owned. What does REO mean? Well, you should be thinking of foreclosure and that portfolio of REO properties that the beneficiary will get if um, borrowers default on their payment and they have to do a non-judicial foreclosure and add to their portfolio of having a real estate owned property. So when a lender forecloses the loan on a property and then sells the property to a buyer, the property is called a real estate owned or REO. So when the market crashed 10 years ago, um, 10 to 12 years ago, there were a ton of REOs. And the big thing is they have giant portfolios. They had tons of portfolios, but they just held on to these REO properties to not inundate the market. And they trickled them on slowly to still try and get um, a decent amount. So they didn't um, inundate the market to increase supply with demand remaining the same because not many people had money to purchase things. Lenders weren't making money. So as investors with cash due to that, if they put a lot on the market, then investors would be able to get a lot for a lot less. Well, it was still cheap back then, but um, these were the REOs that people were buying. And a good thing with REO properties that you do need to know is because when the trustee sale happens and the beneficiary gets the property back, well, you can actually buy an REO property and get title insurance. Whereas if you were to buy from a trustee sale directly, you can't get title insurance. So that is a perk of having of purchasing an REO once the lender's already foreclosed, non-judicial foreclosure, of course, on this one because of the trust deed, they can't always go through the courts and do a judicial foreclosure. Um, and then and then the lender has a portfolio of these foreclosed properties and they're going to sell them to a buyer. And that property is considered an REO. So that's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. If you have any questions, anything like that, feel free to contact us. Make sure to check out our um, exam preparation options as well as our courses. We have a lot to assist you with your studies, um, but I hope this assisted you to make sure to give you an idea of how well you're doing with the material. This is just basic key terms you need to know for the California Real Estate State Exam and make sure you're proficient in this. This is just 25 terms, there's a lot to know, but hopefully this gave you a little bit of a leg up and you'll be um, a little bit better off than you were before you started watching this. Um, my name is Skylar with Accredited. Thanks for watching and good luck with your licensing journey.